Hi, and welcome to Bridge Church Online. Bridge Church is a community of hope, belonging, and purpose here in Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. If you want to learn more about Bridge Church or contribute to Bridge Church financially, you can do so by going to bridgechurch.ca or by downloading the Bridge Connected app. On the website and on the app, you can get resources that will help you grow in your faith. You can learn about all the current events that are going on in the church and so much more. So today, wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, we hope that this service will be a blessing to you. God sees you. God knows you. And God wants to speak to you today. But she can't work the land herself. And Ruth can't work the land. So perhaps she can sell it, or some scholars think that she can sell the rights to harvest on it. And if she does that, she will have like a Band-Aid solution, a short-term solution to her problem. This option meant barely surviving, and it meant no real patriarchal protection. She still wouldn't be part of a household. Remember, this is 3,000 years ago, a time way before feminism, a time where women were completely dependent on men. So she could sell this land, but, but still have no protection. She could sell this land or the rights to this land, but it's a loss of family dignity and honor, and, and that meant something. Uh, it meant dishonor for her dead sons and husband. But... At the emergence of Boaz, she knows that there's another option. She can keep this land within the family and provide the best solution if Ruth and Boaz marry. Boaz can act as the kinsman or guardian redeemer for the family. So what was this kinsman redeemer or guardian redeemer practice? Well, it came out of Leviticus chapter 25, which speaks of how an Israelite was meant to care for those of their kin, whether close relatives or whoever, who, were, uh, who had become widows or orphans, uh, those who were less fortunate or had fallen on hard times. And so there was an obligation for close family members to redeem uh, the person that was in need. A siblings were especially obligated if, if two brothers had two wives and one of uh, the brothers died, it was expected that the other brother would take on the other's wife along with their, their children, that they would keep dignity for the family, that would continue the family line. And so for Boaz, he's further removed. And so while there might have been some cultural pressure, though probably not in the time of the judges, to redeem uh, the question is, will he do it for the family? So Boaz fits the bill, but will he do it? And so today, I'm excited to share this message because this message is just so bridge church. Uh, this is a message about going for it, about going all in for something. There are crossroads in all of our lives where we have choices. We can play it safe or we can do something audacious. We can do something bold. And this is one of those moments for Naomi and Ruth. Naomi knows that Boaz can be kinsman redeemer for their family. If Ruth and, Mar Ruth and Boaz marry, they're set. But will Boaz go for it? And more importantly, will Ruth go for it? And so Naomi sends Ruth on a mission to seal the deal. She says, put on your best clothes. Look good. Wear that knockout dress that you have and get over there. She says, cozy up to Boaz's feet while he's sleeping. She's telling him to propose. You're telling her to propose to a man. Now here we are in, in the year 2022, almost 2023, and so there are sometimes cases where women propose to men. But that's still not very often. That doesn't happen very often. And in our culture, that would be perfectly acceptable. 
Imagine over 3,000 years ago, in a very patriarchal culture, for a woman to propose to a man would have been scandalous and weird. But Ruth decides, yes, I agree. Let's go for it. Ruth makes herself look pretty, and she lays at Boaz's feet. She uncovers his feet. They are alone, together. This was scandalous. Now, some scholars read into this and see sexual overtones, undertones, tones, some sort of tones in it. Um, that's a minority of scholars. The majority of scholars don't see that, and I don't think anything happened in that way. But this was definitely not a moment of being above reproach for Boaz or for Ruth. She's certainly making herself vulnerable and making herself available to him. It is audacious and scandalous and could get people talking, the kind of thing that could hurt your reputation. If we look in verse 9, when he wakes up and sees her at the foot of his bed, he says, ah, who are you? It's dark. He doesn't know who it is. But seriously, why is there this woman sleeping at my feet? This is weird. And she says, I am your servant, Ruth. And then she says this weird phrase. She says, spread the corner of your garment over me. What? Does it mean like, like can I come under the blankets with you? What is she getting at? She says, since you are a guardian redeemer of my family. What does this mean? Well, take a look at this picture. Ian, if you could put that up. Of a, this is a modern day Jewish wedding. You see that in the wedding, the groom will put his bride underneath this talith. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. But it meant that she was coming under his protection, that they were starting a new family together. And so when Ruth says, put the corner of your garment over me, she's saying, no ring. She doesn't have anything. I don't know what that was. She's saying, will you marry me? That's what she's saying in their culture. This is a big risk. Boaz can be offended and be like, what? You're asking me a man? Uh, he could send her away. He could just outright reject her and break her heart and crush her spirit. But of course, we know that's not what happens. So this is a story of audacity on Ruth and Naomi's part. But this is also a story of Hesed love. We talked about that. A love that doesn't give up. A love that, that cares deeply. Take a look at verses 10 and 11. This is Boaz's response again. He says, The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run off after younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do all that you ask. Boaz recognizes that Ruth could have stayed back in Moab gone to her mom and dad's house and married a Moabite man, a younger one. But she doesn't. She says, I might be a Moabite on the outside, but on the inside, I follow the God of Israel now. I don't follow Chemoth, the God of Moab. She says to her mother-in-law, Naomi, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She's sticking with her. But even then, coming back into Bethlehem, she doesn't go for a younger Jewish guy or a richer guy. She's going after Boaz because in her mind, it's the right thing to do. Remember that marriage was less about romance and more about the community, less about the individual, more about the community. She's embracing a sense of loyalty to her ex-husband who died. She's embracing loyalty to her mother-in-law. She's taking up that sense of duty, and she's doing what she deems culturally the right thing. And that audacity pays off, 
Boaz agrees. And while he is also under no obligation under the law, he recognizes it's the right thing to do too. He seeks to do what is right, and then he sends her on her way again with some food for her mother-in-law. These kind of stories of going all in or doing the right thing uh, inspire us. Now, Brent's a football coach, and I know that in any sort of uh, sports game where there's a field, there's a phrase, you know, at the end of the game, you're interviewing someone, they're like, yeah, we left it all on the field today. Left it all on the ice, I guess you could say, for hockey. And that's what Ruth and Naomi are doing. They, they are doing everything they can. They are going all in for their preferred future. Mitch was telling me a story. I've been listening to this uh, audio book on the life of Bono. And uh, he has this story about how U2 was discovered and all these things. And, and these bands, they have to work really hard to try and get discovered. Uh, Mitch was sharing me just a, a great story about the band Boston. And so they were looking for their big break. And they had a guy in the band named Tom. And Tom was an MIT grad. And he decided to go all in in being discovered. And so what he does is he takes all of his money and in his basement, he creates his own recording studio. And this is what he said in an interview. He said, in 1974, I basically blew all of my money. I had been working for five years at that point. I took all of the money and spent it on recording equipment that was good enough to record demos that landed the Epic Records deal. It was a huge gamble. I was married at the time, and that money was supposed to be for a down payment on a house, and I spent it all. Can you imagine that conversation? Uh, sorry, honey, blew it all on, on sound stuff. He says it was very uncomfortable. And so they recorded their first album, Boston in this basement. They send it in, and Mitch tells me that when they heard it, they're like, we can't do any better than that. And that was what was actually sent out to the whole world. This is a story of going all in. And we face these crossroad moments where we might feel God's leading and we have a choice, whether to play it safe or to go for it. Nathan Flynn, who's up on the stage today and preaching next week, he is an entrepreneur, a business guy. Uh, but he was once a government employee, earning a pretty good salary. And he went all in to start the Fort Distillery. That was crazy. What were you thinking? <laughs> you were a man with a dream. Kayla had a dream. They went for it. And then the pandemic hit. Next thing you know, you're hucking hand sanitizer <laughs> instead of the booze you make. But God has blessed them along the journey. And it wouldn't have been possible if they hadn't gone all in. When I was, I'm born on October 23rd. On October 26th, when I was barely 20 years old, I proposed to a 19-year-old girl, Jessica. We've been married ever since. We've got three kids. It's wonderful. But I remember people in my life saying, you're so young. Why are you getting married? Why would you want to get married? Why would you propose? Wait a little bit. Heck no. I love that girl. Jessica, will you marry me? Mic drop. Yes. We went for it. We went all in. And Bridge Church is this sort of church, an audacious church. We started off, okay, let's start a church in Fort Saskatchewan. What does that mean? I don't know. How do you do that? No idea. Let's pray, let's fast, let's figure it out. Adam and Cammie Luth, they're living in Edmonton. Hey, Adam and Cammie, you wanna be part of this? Okay, sure. Very undramatically, yes. Adam and Cammie moved to Fort Saskatchewan. Our church didn't even have a name. <laughs> we didn't have anywhere to meet. But you guys were crazy in a good way. You saw a vision that, that God had for this city that we collectively found together 
and you moved here. You went all in. We're trying to find a space to meet as a church. Where are we going to meet? I don't know. We can't meet in the rec center every week. Uh Uh-oh. Well, there's this space on the top of a medical building. Huh. That's kind of weird. Perfect. We're all about weird. And we went all in. We got some startup funds from the denomination, supposed to pay the pastor's salary for a few years. Are we going to use it on that? (laughs) No way. Forget that. We'll do some renovations up in the medical building. Oh, gee, hope we get permits. But we did. COVID hits. What are we going to do? Hey, Mike. (laughs) I have a a, a mug from early on in this church that says, uh, what's it say? Don't panic. Just call Mike or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. Just call Mike. We're like, let's do a drive-in service when the government was so scared of COVID and everybody told us no over and over and over again. Meanwhile, we're building the stage while they're saying no in faith that it's going to work out. Gavin came that very first Sunday. Welcome to the show, kid. (laughs) We're weird. And now, you know, you're going to have your soup and buns after the service, and you're going to hear how God is once again calling us to step out in faith. Lots of faith as we try to figure out what are the next steps for Bridge Church? What is this journey that God's taking us on collectively together? Last week, we talked about Ruth chapter two, where we saw God's providence because he placed Ruth in the field of Boaz. We saw God's providential mercy in the way that that Boaz um, treated Ruth. But if last week was about providence, in God's hand, today is about taking the step ourselves. It's a, it's a pivot from providence to audacity. The truth is, in our theology, we understand that God is in control of all things. He's running the universe. But we still need to say yes. We still have a choice. We still have to step out in faith. The uh, monks have a saying, ora and labora, pray and work. You don't just pray and hope that everything will turn out. And you don't just work and not work and just hope everything will turn out. No, you need to pray and work. And this is what Ruth and Naomi did. They see a moment. She goes at his feet. They go for it. There's personal risk, but it all works out. And so the question today is, How is God calling you, you, to step out in faith? Where do you need some Holy Spirit audacity in your life right now? What does it mean to show love, to embrace a sense of duty and loyalty like Ruth and Boaz did? What does that mean for you? Maybe you've been dating a guy or dating a girl and it's time to propose and you've been chickening out and God says, oh, all the parents are getting nervous. (laughs) And God's saying, it's time to do it. Have some courage. Be audacious. Get married. Maybe that's where you're at today. Maybe you're working for the government and it's time to start a business, to say yes to God's dreams for you and see what happens. Maybe it's time to start a new job. Maybe it's time to go from a faith where you go to church every once in a while and you say, yeah, I'm a Christian, to a faith where where Jesus becomes your center. He becomes your everything, where it's not just an add-on on your life, but Jesus is running your life. You know, there's the metaphor, you know, Jesus, Jesus is my co-pilot. Forget the co-pilot stuff. Sit in the back seat. Even better, get in the trunk so you can't get out. It's time to put Jesus in charge. Maybe that's the step for you. Maybe you're here today, and this alpha marriage thing, we've been pumping every week, and you're like, oh man, I don't have any excuses because it's free child care. There's free catered meals. Seven weeks. I can clear up my Wednesdays for a while, but you're a little afraid. 
And it's time to step out and see what happens, to strengthen your marriage, to save your marriage, wherever you're at. Perhaps God is leading you to be there. Or perhaps you've been on the edges of Christianity. You've been kind of dipping your toe in, and it's time to get baptized, amen? It's time to take that step of faith and say, God, I don't know where you're gonna take me. I don't know what the future holds, but I know this, I'm with you. Maybe that's where you're at today. So in our Advent reading that the Rachel's read, and I'll, I'll invite up the worship team, we heard the story of Joseph. Can you imagine dating someone and you, you're, you're committed to waiting until marriage before you consummate your relationship. And then you find out that your fiance is pregnant. Yeah, yeah, what? This isn't good. And Joseph, he could have flipped his lid. And he says, you know what? I'm just going to divorce her quietly. I don't want to dishonor her more than I have to. And then... God speaks to Joseph and says, don't worry, I got you. Step out in faith, let's go on this journey. And Joseph goes all in for the Messiah. It's bold, it's beautiful. And that is, that is the story of Christmas. God, rich in mercy, while we were still sinners, saw us, could have left us on our own. No. God, rich in mercy, sends his son Jesus, part of the Trinity, God in the flesh, dwells among us. Talk about audacity. Talk about a scandal. God became a little baby. Babies spit up. Babies are gross and wonderful. And God became one. This is the story of Christmas, God's audacious love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for who you are and all that you've done. You are a God of audacity who will do everything to chase us down and save us. God, we open up ourselves to your mercy, to your love. God, sometimes our hearts get calcified and, and hard and we resist you. Holy Spirit, break down our resistance. God, coming to you now and we pray do a work in us Lord I pray for boldness for audacity in my heart and in the hearts of everyone here everybody who's listening God show us if there's places in our lives that you want us to step up to take a risk to be bold, to be audacious and we pray Lord that when you allow us to, when we do God that you would meet us there that you would provide a way. God, thank you that this is a church of dreamers. <laughs> Keep us that way, God. Help us never to lose that entrepreneurial spirit. God, be honored in our church. Be glorified through the work we do. Amen.